Well, today we're going to welcome Jacqueline Bublitz. Did I get that right, Jacqueline? Nice, nicely pronounced. Good. Okay. Well, you had a very successful first novel called Before You Knew My Name. Mm -hmm. But what we're here to talk about today is your second novel, Leave the Girls Behind. Um, <laughs> both these novels um, involve dead young women. H how does the new novel differ from the first one? And how, and how did you get the idea? Hmm. It's a good question. I'll start with the ways in which it's the same in that it's set a year after uh, Before You Knew My Name. It's not a sequel, but it exists in that same universe. Uh, so it's a year later uh, in the same area of Manhattan on the Upper West Side, but with a whole new cast of characters. Uh, but I wanted that through line uh, from my first book into my second of um, zeroing in on, on a community and seeing how... Um, different types of gendered crime um, might affect different people in that community. Uh, it is my first book. I always say I was an, I was an accidental crime writer. I didn't realize I was writing a crime novel. I really didn't, even though it is centered around um, the murder of a young woman. Um, and so I have learned so much in the last few years. That book came out 2021 um, on my side of the world, New Zealand and Australia and Twitter. 20, yes, and 20, we lose track of time, don't we, because of uh, that thing called COVID. And then 2022 um, in the States. Um, in the time since then, I've really become a student of, of crime novels and uh, everything, actually, from true crime all the way through to uh, you know, the old school detective novels, um, of which there is a, a quite famous um, contributor, Dame Nia Marsh from New Zealand, um, who was... Um, a cohort of Agatha Christie and I didn't even know that so I've learned so much about um, this genre that I sort of fell into and then was caught by readers and captured you know, like actually taken care of I need a better word than than caught um still in crime mode um as so I was really taken care of by the crime community readers uh, reviewers um uh, and so I, in, this book is a, a, a little bit more of a tribute to that. It's, I'm a little more, I try to be aware of the tropes that I was pushing back against because I'm still pushing, I, I like to push the boundaries and I like to play with those tropes, but I did it a lot more consciously this time um, where there's a lot of little Easter eggs, what I call my little Taylor Swift moments where I put little moments or, you know, around even the names of the canines, uh, the dogs in the um, in the book are attributes to uh, people who follow you know, true crime would, would recognise some uh, very famous criminal profilers uh, that I've borrowed names from and things like that. Oh, yes. <laughs> So it's been, yeah, it's, it's. Ted it's, Bundy being one. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. I wore, and then I had to make up a whole, but somebody asked me, there's a particular crime that happens in New Zealand and somebody, a local person where I am in New Zealand asked me, did that, did the Marimar River murders really happen? And I'm like, oh no, <laughs> no, I just like, I made, I made those up obviously borrowing from um, many, many real life cases. It's unfortunately not that hard to come up with your own serial killers and, um, uh, so, murderous. So, but now Ruth, the, your main character in Leave the Girls Behind, I think the first character, the first book was also, your hero's heroine was also Ruth, is that right? Or, uh, Ru uh, so we had uh, Ruby, so Alice was our, Ruby. Ruby uh, Alice Ruby. was our dead girl, I don't, and I, it, didn't actually um, think about until recently with names. I, I, I cannot get a character down on the page or on the screen um, these days if I don't have her name, if I don't have her name right. And for um, this particular for Ruth, Ruth Ann Baker, um, and I call her and most of her close friends call her Ruthie. She was always Ruthie to me. Um, whereas Ruby in the first book, it took, she went through about 10 different names before I settled on my mother's dog's name <laughs> and I was like the, the kindest soul I know I'll take that name and I can live with that you know and talk about talk about Ruby so Ruthie um she always was she's um a tribute to someone that I um, know and admire the, the name Ruthie um and also it meant that I could play with as a grown-up she's Ruth but really actually she's she's um still in many ways um stuck in something that happened when she was seven years old right right and so Ruth or Ruthie talks the ghosts, right? 
<laughs> yeah, well, it's an interest, and as I was, um, and there's another through line from um, before you knew my name, where I treat, well, I tread very lightly with the idea of being able to communicate, you know, with those who have passed on, or communicate with the dead, in that I'm, I'm never trying to say where they're coming from. I'm not even necessarily saying that they're real, that they may in fact be in in one's in one's head. Um, yeah. And so with Ruth, I did a lot of research into uh, what they now call DID. It used to be called um, uh, multiple personality disorder. We, ha we now have a, a much more clinical and, and nicer name for that DID, dissociative identity disorder. Did a lot of research into that um, in informing uh, Ruth's character, which isn't to say that her dead girls, her chorus of dead girls are just in her head. They may in fact be real, but I wanted to leave that, and I wanted to give some ambiguity there. So a reader who is disinclined to um, sort of suspend their disbelief when it comes to the supernatural. It, it works very well. There are Thank you. Surprise, surprises that I won't tell, I won't say what surprises, but it works very well. I think. <laughs> Well, Ruth goes on a journey, and what is that journey about? She's meeting three wives of men who married murderers? So, so yeah, so Ruth is, and it off, from the off, it should be clear that she's quite an unreliable narrator, but she's also an incredibly self-aware. She's, she's aware of her tendency to, like, run off um, and see. She's got something called, I've had to write it down because I can never pronounce it, apophenia which is the tendency to see connections uh where there are none between like people or things and, and that's often um as i've learned in my research what gives rise to things like conspiracy theories seeing patterns where there aren't and i really wanted to mimic with ruth's um journey uh where how we can sometimes feel we're on true crime forums and we start seeing all this information about like, oh, i think i've got it i think i know i think i know uh what happened and of course we're only being given a small part of the picture so for ruth who has always been convinced that the man that murdered um her best friend uh 19 years ago beth so they were children that's when they were seven she's always been convinced that he had other victims that's not something that she's ever sort of had, had she, that she's ever wavered on but when a, a little girl goes missing uh in present in present day it was 2015 in new york uh ruth suddenly uh begins to wonder because the perpetrator of that crime ethan is dead she begins to wonder if he might not have had a partner in crime and because of uh sort of evidence that comes to light and memories that um, that both she and her so-called dead girls are um, having and discussing, she begins to wonder if that might not have been a woman, potentially a young woman, uh, who helped um, Ethan Osborne, um, so like a partner in crime, like perpetrate his crimes. And so she um, very... Um, uh, without much thought um, and sort of in a panic, I would say, in, a, in quite a panic with this new information, she t takes off around the world to meet these three women who were connected to uh, Ethan 19 years ago, but inexplicably um, or perhaps um, not coincidentally, all three of those women have connections to other murderers or serial killers, uh, which then allows um, allowed me to explore what is it um, that a that um, what is that attraction or the allure that these types of men have? Yeah. Or in some cases, uh, why don't we see the, the wives and partners of these men as, as victims as well um, if they truly didn't know what their partner was doing? So it, it was a lot of rich, um, could have gone in many, many different directions with this one. Oh, yes. It's very complicated. You, you, you have a <laughs> lot of characters. How did you keep up with all those characters? Well, I, I'm... It's interesting because it feels like it feels very small to me, and um, uh, because I've lived I've lived with them for so long, and the characters always come first. So we have uh, we have Ruth, um, and then we have these three women: um, Amity, um, Rose, and Helen. And it, those women were before I even started the story. I knew who they were. I knew what their quirks were. I knew uh, what their sort of twists, the twists in their own, the twists and turns of their own lives, which would then lend itself to the twists in the story would be. And so it actually feels like this really small uh, group of, of women to me. Uh, and yet I'm, I'm aware because of the 19 year um, gap, there's name changes. As I, as I point out with one character, women get married, they, they, 
they change their names. Um, I'm someone who goes by a couple of names. I'm Jacqueline, but my family calls me Rock. Um, and so it was, so I think it's been good to realize that, oh, yeah, that, that can, introducing these people that live in my head like real people, uh, introducing them onto the page um, to be considerate of the reader and knowing exactly, you know, who is who um, at any given time. How long, did it take, how, did it, how long did it take you to write the second book? This was, because um, it was, so, gosh, like upwards of seven years for the, I didn't, I wasn't in the business um at the at the time and I didn't have you know an agent or a publisher and so this I I had a, a I was a two book deal um and so I knew that people I knew that certain people were waiting for it I actually was working on something else during um our lockdowns here in New Zealand so 2021 in 2022 um and it was very sort of interior story as befit i think the the time that i was living in like practically you know very much locked down in in new zealand um at the time couldn't leave um sometimes the neighborhood let alone the country uh and out the back of that um so in the back of my mind rather was this really dynamic story with the with these women that I, you know and i already knew who they were and I'd, I'd already sort of made notes on them but i kept asking them to wait just wait like i'm, I'm not in the right frame of mind uh, and then it became evident that um, it, this was the story I actually wanted to tell. So I put down uh, I put down that novel, which would, which had been completed as well, uh, and start, And I wrote the first draft of what became Leave the Girls Behind in I think well certainly less than three months. And then the work, Whoa, yeah, it three just, months. Well, because I knew who these women were. So the hardest part, and I was thinking about this yesterday, um, the hardest part was deciding which parts of their stories to tell. Uh, because they all have these really rich uh, backstories, and I have so much backstory, mm -hmm. you know, on all of them. Uh, and yes, deciding um, who, um, which parts of their stories, and how much I, how much, you know, because ultimately it's Ruthie's story, so they sort of have to become the supporting role. So that took, I think, I guess a, and which is quite usual, a year of edit. So I'd say it's a year and a half to two years. Um, but they've that first draft just like bleh. and that, that doesn't normally happen. It's certainly not happening with book, it's not happening with book three, but hopefully at some point, um, you know, something subconscious. So it took you a long happen. time to edit, it took you a short time to write and a long time yeah, to edit. I more prolific if I could edit at the speed with which I uh, can like get out the first draft. But unfortunately, I think everybody I think, wishes that. Yeah, yeah. How, how did you how did you become a writer? What what led you there? It's such um um a a big thing for me to consider because it's still a little bit um, crazy. It feels so for me. It's like it was almost a somewhat like out of body experience that I'm that this is my new life. And part of that, I think, is that it, uh, my career began and, and took off in in some ways during a pandemic. And so I wasn't present uh, physically and maybe even a little bit sort of emotionally and mentally, like so many of us, for so many of these amazing things that were happening um, when my when I got my agent and they very quickly got a book deal and then. And the book, um, you know, found its audience and its legs really quickly. Um, so, to be, I was always a reader. I was always a, somebody who told stories in her head. Uh, when I think back on my childhood, I never wrote anything down. I have, I have memories of like one. So I'm not somebody. I have memories of one story that I wrote um, about a genie that lived in a bourbon bottle, which I thought was like, I don't know, I was like seven. It must have. Um, I had older siblings. So that's where the bourbon bottle must have come in. But a genie that lived in a bourbon bottle. That's the only thing I could ever remember writing. Magnificent bourbon bottle genie was the title. So I'm not someone who, who um, I don't think anyone pegged me teachers or anyone along the way, oh, she's going to be a writer. But I was living almost entirely <laughs> in my own head. Um, um, they were, there's a, um, I don't, a saying, we probably don't say it anymore, away with the fairies. Like I was like, and I, would, I had a horse. I lived in the country. So I lived yeah, sort of with a lot of farmland and I would ride my horse and I would write myself into television shows. So whatever television show I loved at the time. Um, and it was a wide range of things from Days of Our Lives to Baywatch to, to slightly more high end things. I would, LA Law was a big one. I would write myself into these shows and have a recurring character and I could just go back to that um, um, 
at, at any time and then I'd switch to a new TV show. So I was always creating, but I didn't know that you could be, I come from a place where there's a lot of sports, um, successful sports people and people who go on to do like uh, amazing things. But I didn't know any writers. I didn't know um, anybody in this sort of creative field. It felt, and also I was convinced, <laughs> I was convinced you had to be like 19 and have written your first novel. So by the time I was in my 20s, I was a voracious reader. I wasn't writing myself into TV shows anymore, <laughs> but I was reading, you know, everything that Oprah recommended and more. Um, but I, I did, I thought, oh, well, I've, it's too late, uh, which is ridiculous. And I'd like anybody uh, watching, listening, um, it's never too late. But somehow I'd got it in my head when I was very young that you needed to be sort of that precocious, um, high achiever when you were young to, to be a true novelist. Not true at all. And it wasn't until my 30s when um, a friend um, sort of said, you know, you have – you." You, when I would write speeches or for someone's wedding or birthday, um, I, I knew I was good at doing that. And I had a friend who was like, it's so obvious that you've got a, a particular talent. Um, you need to do something with it. Um, like you're, you're lucky to have the ability to move people with words, is I think the more gentle way of what he actually said to me. Um, so he was basically get off your behind and start writing. And so, <laughs> I, I, so I did. And then it took what I realized was what had always been missing was this, which seems obvious now, but the story, the impetus. So I had this idea for my first novel that was very simple. What would it be like to, what would the connection be like, you know, between if you found a dead body, what would your connection to that young murder victim be? And from that, from that sort of, what would it be like with the story? And then I was able for the first time ever to conceive of a world and build a world. And now I can do it. Now it's like, training maybe for a marathon or something now I can take it further and further because I've um gotten out of here and I know how to get things down on the page yeah so uh, that's my how, how did you find your agent yeah well this one is um I love I love this part of my story because I hope it's really aspirational to people who are inspiring because I had with um, but what became before you knew my name, I had been rejected 48 times by different agents. Um, and I was shooting very high and, and very early, which I don't, I do recommend aim high, but not too early if you're going to aim high. Um, 48 it, times is, is not unusual at all. Yeah. Really and, <laughs> but I, I didn't, so on this side of the world, um, it's, it's a little, uh, different often, um, so in Australia and New Zealand, you can go and you can go directly to publishers to the to the I don't think they call it a slush pile anymore, but they will they have competitions. It's a little bit more accessible, uh, but only a tiny bit because I don't think any publishing, <laughs> I don't think any anywhere is is fully accessible. Uh -huh. Yeah, there are gatekeepers at you know and for for good and for bad at, at every level of the business. But I had been I spent some time in the in the United States and I had met a wonderful. She's a now a New York Times bestselling author, Ita Froom. She wrote A Woman Is No Man. But when I met her, we were both um, we did a summer course together um, in Connecticut, and she taught me so much about querying and uh, that whole that what I call the American. It's not though, but what I think of as the American process. And um, I'm forever grateful to her because she was the first person to show me. Oh, there's like a there's the here's the business side of it, and I could understand that because I worked in sales and marketing, um, and so I have a, an agent who's based in London, um, which some people, which is quite unusual, I think, for people on this side of the world. But it was because of you know those lessons I learned from from what people like Ita. Uh, of how you know get your get your query letter get it right get your pages right know the story know the agent that you're submitting to but ultimately with all of the work that I did and all of the rejections I found my agent um Carly Simpson New Year's Eve um coming into 2020 so 2019 my dad had just died I was really um not having um the best time of it um understandably and I found a photograph I found a list of agents who were looking for um you know you know new writers or emerging writers and I really liked her photograph I thought she looked so interesting and nice and and I was you know what I'm just going to send um this one on New Year's Eve I'm just going to send the query and, and obviously she, the kind of work that she was interested in that I made sure we were a match for that as right. well right, um, right. and then 
by February, uh, we were signed and we were going out on submission um, by, by the time the London Book Fair didn't happen. I think it, it went because the, the pandemic happened right at the time that we went out on submission as well. So there, it always feels like there's something very serendipitous about when we met because I think had we met, had it been a few weeks later, had I not had done that New Year's Eve kind of um I'm just going to try one more time. I might have, I might have fallen into the cracks of of that really um, that period, in February, March, 2020, uh, especially March, 2020, when nobody really knew what was happening. Um, and so, yeah, I did. There's a lot that feels very um, serendipitous, uh, and then there's a lot where I can see that um, persistence and not giving up. Um, and, and blind faith as well like yeah. New Year's Eve you know what let's just try one more time and um it works and she's been now my agent um she's wonderful um editorial agent as well as a um emotional support person yes yes where is she based in- so she's in London so I just got to London. meet her for the first time a couple of weeks ago I went um from um this side of the world I went I went north and uh, we met for the first time and it was like we had um knowing each well basically just knowing each other forever was the nicest um because that distance um is hard but I have publishers in Australia the UK and then obviously my wonderful publishers in New York as well at Emily Bessler um so I do I am quite isolated um, which is good for writing um but when we come to the you know when it's time for the book to be shared with the world it's um it's always nice to to be with my people um, instead sure. of on the other side of the world. Sure, you bet. Well, you say every everybody has a story. How real are some of Ruth's experiences to your own? Um, I think <laughs> that she is a product of my obsession with CPTSD, PTSD, so any kind of trauma, um, not necessarily my own, uh, but things that I've observed in terms of how people um, that I know are um, still at, still underneath it all, often reacting like they're seven, <laughs> like they're seven years old, um, and and that it com- I come from a place of I hope deep empathy in in, in looking at how um, our childhoods impact um, the adults that that we become in ways that we're sometimes aware of and often in ways that that we are not. So I don't have um, I don't share with Ruth anything except a love of musical theatre. Uh, which she has, I like to put in my, you know, I like to keep my characters um, real in the sense that they, you know, these awful things can be happening, but that doesn't mean that the rest of the, the world isn't going on around them. You know, people, friends and family falling in love, um, having their own dramas, having their own, you know, um, issues to contend with. And actually, and you know, sometimes giving them something like for Ruth, she works at a, um, uh, a bar, Sweeney Todd's sports bar, uh, where her boss Owen um, is absolutely obsessed with Stephen Sondheim, and so I like to. I, that's that's me putting a little bit of myself into onto the page because I would often joke um, that Sondheim is my Shakespeare. So when I would sit on a panel with writers and they would be talking about Dostoevsky or Shakespeare, and you know, beautifully talking about the influences, and I'd be like, I really love musical theatre. <laughs> And I take a lot of my rhythms of writing, my the way that I sort of uh, hear the words, and they come out like like um, my version of composing. Like I like to think that I compose my stories. Um, so yeah, that's probably with with Ruth. Um, you always give them, a, you know, she's a little. Um, um, she had some issues. She had some issues around trusting people, which I think I, I can. I probably I can understand that at least, but I certainly haven't gone through any of the uh, things that she has, and I don't have uh, you know a chorus of dead girls sitting at the edge of my bed. But I do have a lot of voices in my head, so <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I don't know. <laughs> and um, uh, how did you? Did you always dream of being a writer, or what? What I, else did you did want? I, to do? <laughs> well, my I my dad had three. Um, my wonderful dad, who passed away in 2019, and unfortunately didn't get to see any of this. But he had three dreams for me, and I, I kind of I kind of absorbed them, but they were very. Um, well, I'll just tell you, um, a politician, 
um, an Olympic swimmer or a bookseller, own my own bookstore. So these were the three things. He would say, you could do anything, but those were the three things that he, um, when I was little, and uh, the politician, because I was um, like very argumentative and um, confident, always the third speaker in a debate when I was younger, um, you know, bringing, it, bringing, it, bringing the argument home. Um, and interestingly, I ended up going to school, I went, I went to school with a, a woman, a Carmel, who became the deputy prime minister of New Zealand. So up uh, for a while. So it, it is. Um, I guess he, he, she, she was from my neighbourhood. So my dad, you know, wasn't wasn't too far off in his aspirations. Olympic swimmer because I was really good at butterfly when I was younger, and uh, that and uh, but certainly wasn't going to get to Olympic level. But I loved his confidence in me. And then bookseller because there were two bookstores on the main street of my tiny town um, in a place called Waitara in New Zealand. And I would always be late for school because I would stop in at each one and I would just be books. And I'll, and I'll be honest, as I got a bit older, magazines as well, I would just get lost in these worlds. So I think I, um, again, like not, I didn't know that you could be a writer. I, how would you do, how would you um and how would you be as how would I ever be as good as these people that I uh, admired, which I've since learned is a big thing that gets in the way of a lot of writers. Yeah, like where where you are comparing yourself to the these people who have mastered their craft and also have had had a lot of help along the way, because obviously any finished book that we read has, and I didn't know this for a long time, and I certainly do now. A lot of it's collaborative in many ways. It's still the author's story. It's still their work. But there's people, editors, external people, internal to your publishing company saying, you know, that whole bit doesn't work or, you know, we're not really, you seem really attached to this, but have you thought about, you know, the fact that it doesn't make sense? Um, and um, ah. not knowing any of that. And I think that's important for anyone um, who has, um, who would like to be a writer, but isn't doesn't know where to start is that where you start will never be where you end up um, in terms of the story um, because so much of it exists in the in the editing of it so much of it in the in the I was explaining it to a young woman the other day it's like one of the only um, was a, a something in my life where I am both building something and dismantling it at the same time so the friction or the tension of creativity is building a world and then dismantling and getting to right to the core of it at the same time and so yeah understanding that and I now say oh it sort of seemed perfectly obvious that I was going to become a writer but <laughs> even 10 years ago I would have been like but how would I do like how how would I I work like 14 hours a day I'm really um I don't know how so and, and, so your day job, yeah. How is your day job? Is your day job as a, a marketing person? No, so my, I'm lucky enough now that my day job is writing, um, or it should be more often than it actually is. Yes. <laughs> so I'm lucky with um, the, uh, just the momentum of my career um, that for now at least I get to work. Um, I get to write full time. And so at the moment I'm researching um, a very clear um plan which is um not always the case for for book three which will be the follow-on again not a not a sequel or but it is part of the in universe it'll be a year after leave the girls behind 2016 quite a few things happened in 2016 in in the united states set in new york again um and so i'm I love that I get to call this work. I'm just watching documentaries and taking people out for coffees who work in, for example, criminal justice system over here. Just to so it's, re, it's all everything is research at the moment. It's such a rich, wonderful thing that you um, don't necessarily get to have. You know that you don't get the time um, when you are um, yeah working your your day job as well. So I've, I know how fortunate I am, but the key is <laughs> when to stop that kind of <laughs> like. Blah, and then actually put it on the page. So let's see. Yes, yes, put it on the page. Well, what advice do you have for writers who are trying to break in? <laughs> well, oh, so much. I mean, per like, mm, persistence is an, an obvious one, but that, I think that's a bit sort of, um, that's a, what does that actually mean? It means knowing when to, um, when to push and, and and when to sort of step back and and by that it can be really disheartening if you've got a story that you believe in and you're and I and I mentioned my 48 rejections and you're sending out you can get obsessed with um finding the agent and 
understandably, I understand it completely, the finding the agent and then all of the steps that, that happen from there. My advice would be to always consider the business side of it but the story comes first keep working like just keep working on on your story and every time you think it's done it's there's always something else that you can come back to and that keep that keeps you a writer so you like it, it doesn't you don't you do if you you know at some point if you want to be and especially traditionally published there are steps that you're going to need to um follow or things that you're going to need to obtain like an agent like a publishing deal but what makes you a writer is the writing. So never lose, never lose sight of that, and uh, pay attention to the criticism that you, or the critiques that you receive, and realize that it's not all created equal. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a really hard one. But you, you learn. You know, I had a, um, as an example after I got the publishing deal for um, what became before you knew my name. I got. A, a rejection that came in from a lovely, lovely agent. But she said, you know, this will, I love your writing, but this story would never sell because no one wants to read about like a, 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 a dead girls and somebody else had said, nobody wants to read a teenage narrator. And these things could some, and yet another uh, person had said in her very kind rejection, you're making things a little too difficult for the reader like you obviously uh i have you know there's a you obviously read a lot of literary fiction and you're, you're actually you're going too far with you know you're clobbering people over the head with your metaphors and that was she was right about that this person over here wasn't right about that nobody wants to read about a <laughs> dead girl it just needed to be good enough for them well you know a subjectively objectively maybe uh to suspend their disbelief or the story had to be unique enough but over here this piece of advice it it, it was a little painful like oh yeah I'm showing off with all of these metaphors but she was right so for aspiring writers not yeah I guess to sum that up not every piece of criticism or not every critique that you get um is is something that you should take to heart uh, but pay attention yeah pay attention to the messenger and to whether they're trying to help you or they're just trying to say no nah, it's it's not it's you know it's not good enough because uh, everyone once you're writing a book I think anyone who touches it wants to in some way like imprint on that book as well I, I feel um Right. And then, yeah, just persistence. And and if you believe in your story, um, you only need one yes as well. And I I used to tell myself that all the time. I just need I just need one yes. I need it to be like the right yes because there's a lot of you know there's things to be aware of in this industry as well. Are people not preying on the fact that you know, so many people want to break into the industry? But if you do your homework, we would say do the mahi, which means work mahi here in New Zealand. Do the mahi, um, and your only submitting to or, or you know talking with people who are credible then you only need one of them to in you need one uh, and then you're on your way and then be prepared for a whole new set of like <laughs> that's another that's another we can talk about that another time is that yeah becoming when you finally get when your dreams um come true there's a line in uh, the musical wicked um which i also quote um him um, cheekily in in the book, but that Glinda says, you know, it when she when her dreams come true, she says, it is, I admit, the tiniest bit unlike I anticipated. And I <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah. Well, Jacqueline Bublitz, thank you very much for talking with us today. Well, thank you so much. I'm just, I'm really excited to be um, talking about the new book and and also to be. Um, yeah, sharing what I've learned. It's been an interesting couple. It's been an interesting couple of years as a debut, and then coming into my sophomore novel. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you.